How's it going YouTube? Cody Bernardi here with another YouTube video. In today's video, I wanna go over some of my practices uh, when it comes to online security. Now, a lot of people right now are working from home, uh, working remotely or whatever, and it's kind of a new thing for them. And that opens up a new threat landscape for various businesses. So I wanna go over uh, just some things that I do personally to just kind of make sure that I'm as secure as possible when browsing online. Uh, the first thing I wanna go over is the various browser extensions that I use. Now, what browser you use is really up for debate. Uh, I personally like to use Firefox, but if you like Chrome or whatever you want to use that's fine um some will collect more data than others but at the end of the day uh really depends on your threat model um i personally like firefox uh, they seem pretty active actively engaged with the open source community so i just choose them because of that so a few add-ons that i use uh so the first one is going to be a password manager now this should be universal for everyone, uh, not just staying safe online. I guess it is staying safe online, but uh, a password manager of some sorts. I personally use one that's built online, uh, but again, really depends on your threat model. If you like absolutely need to make sure that the credentials on that account do not get breached, uh, you got to reevaluate that because in that case, something like a, a a book itself being secured somewhere is a little bit better than storing it on a database online that, you know, is accessible, quote unquote, accessible by, you know, people around the world, uh, if that makes sense. I'm not saying that, you know, password managers are just open to the world, but people are actively going to be trying to find a way to, you know, recover, not recover, but retrieve passwords from these password managers. So it makes the threat landscape a little different if you write it in a book. But at the end of the day, the biggest threat to our passwords is A, uh, credential stuffing. So that's basically people breaching, you know, a service, and then they try those credentials on different sites to see if they work. And then it's just a giant list like, okay, this, uh, you know, email and password has worked on this site doesn't work on this site, but worked on this site, this site, this site, this site, um, and that's credential stuffing, uh, as well as um, businesses or, you know, entities not uh, doing proper password storage. You know, they're storing it in plain text. They're not salting it or they're not updating their systems. So there's a slew of things. So uh, just having a password manager, whether that's a book or online and having different passwords and long passwords uh, for each account is what I personally would recommend to anyone but do not reuse passwords because you do have that credential stuffing attack that is actively being going on or that is actively ongoing and is automated. So, uh, so yeah, that is a password manager. The second one that I use is HTTPS everywhere, which kind of requests a secure channel from my browser to that, uh, that website. Um, and it doesn't block HTTP requests. Uh, I could still go to websites if they only have HTTP, but for the majority of my browsing, I would say 99.99%, I would say, of my browsing is through HTTPS. Now that's done in the background because of HTTPS everywhere. It just automatically requests the HTTPS variant of that website. So if I go, let's say hypothetically, Google still serve their website over HTTP, which they don't. Um, but if I was to type in, you know, HTTP google.com, it would automatically request the HTTPS version of that, making a secure channel and limiting uh, an attack of sniffing the data going from my computer to google.com. Any breach of that, I would get notified and the connection would not happen. Uh, yes, so you could use public Wi-Fi. I made a video on why you don't need a VPN. You can use public Wi-Fi and browse on Google and no one will know what you're browsing. They just see that you're on Google because of DNS. So yeah, next one I have is Privacy Badger. So this blocks various kinds of cookies. You can either just completely block cookies. You can completely block the website or say that connection uh, is good. Now I, I'll go into what I have on my LAN to prevent this stuff, but I also have Privacy Badger uh, installed on my browser. So I could just deny uh, doubleclick.net my cookies. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video real quick since I mentioned I do have some things on my LAN local area network that I have that helps block unwanted trackers, adware, malware, and just various other telemetry metrics. So 
I didn't mention it in the video, that's why I'm pausing the video. So I actually have a pie hole set up on my LAN, which basically acts as a local DNS server uh, with a blacklist of known ad trackers and uh, telemetry links. It's basically just a giant list of URLs. Uh, and then anytime a client on my network requests out to that um, DNS name, it actually just gets blocked. It doesn't resolve the IP address, thus making that uh, connection not happen. So for example, my TV, which is a smart TV, sends a ton of traffic out to a random C2 server for whatever reason. I don't know what's in that connection because it's secure. However, I am blocking a significant amount of traffic through the pie hole. Uh, and this allows me to block any sort of trackers on any device on my network, not just my browser. On with the video. Moving on, Facebook container. So this one's pretty nice if you're trying to log in, you know, do signal sign on with your Facebook account. Uh, it will kind of, I, I don't actually know entirely how it works, but it blocks Facebook trackers if you try to go on different websites and like log in with Facebook. Um, so I find that pretty helpful. Uh, Wayback Machine. So this one isn't so much keeping you secure online, but it's a nice way to archive a site, you know, in its current state. Doesn't really have anything to do with what we're talking about, but I have that. Adblock, ad, ad block Plus, holy crap, that's a mouthful. That's pretty uh, standard. Uh, Shodan, pretty, uh, that doesn't really have to do a thing with this. And yeah, that's it for uh, my browser extensions. The next thing that I would recommend is software updates. Now, um, I could tell everyone right now that's a Windows user, you will get updates every second Tuesday of every month. It's called Patch Tuesday, so update your stuff. If you're running, uh, you know, Windows computers, you know, update it. Uh, if you're running Exchange servers, definitely up update those. Uh, but just keep everything up to date. You know, check to see if there's updates on everything that you have installed on your computer. While yes, your computer at home might be, you know, you're you're probably thinking, well, no one can get into my internal network if it's not publicly available. Well, if you download something, yeah, it becomes an external thing. They get a reverse shell back out to a C2 and now they have persistent access on your computer. So update everything. It, it could be as little as, you know, if you're running Microsoft Outlook and you open up a certain kind of email that has a vulnerability on it. Well, you didn't patch your Outlook. So you get what I'm saying. So patch everything, even if it seems a little benign, just patch it. It's it's best practice. Um, I personally patch everything, but uh, if you want, you can check to see if there's any availability issues with patches because from time to time, Microsoft and various vendors botch a patch and causes availability issues. So I just personally patch everything. If it doesn't work, if it causes issues, then I just revert that patch. Um, moving on. Number three, social media. This one is pretty, um, I guess, uh, interesting. Uh, now I do OSINT and social media is the Achilles heel or yeah, Achilles is the Achilles of a lot of people. Um, especially some people in security. I personally have been, uh, poor in my security practices in the past. Um, I got a little famous on Twitter, InfoSec Twitter. Um, but that's, uh, that's a different discussion, and that was actually kind of funny. Um, but social media, so, you know, post things. Like, I'm not an advocate saying don't have social media. Like, it's a great way to connect with people, especially during, uh, you know, all this COVID stuff. But just be aware of what you're posting because anything you post online can and will be archived forever i mean i just told you about the the wayback machine extension i have right there i just have to hit click and then it saves it now yes i know that doesn't save like facebook posts and stuff like that but i can still screenshot that and archive it uh, but just be aware of what you're posting uh and minor things like if you're gonna say you're gonna be on vacation well hope to god you didn't post like bought a new home photo here's my keys and your address in the background like if i was a shady friend of yours i'd break into your house because you you know you post pictures inside your house and you got all these fancy things in there well god those have a lot of value now do they um so clean up social media facebook is pretty good uh, by default now given all of the controversy that they've had in the past it's really hard to scrape data from a public view on facebook but then again like go through your privacy settings i think they do have like a tool that walks you you know line by line uh things that you can lock down 
Uh, I personally recommend like not having anything accessible to the public. Um, while yes, they could still search your name, but they can't click on your profile photo. They can't click on your cover photo. They can't click on your friends. They can't really do anything. They just see your name. Now, the reason why this matters and why uh, having your friends list locked down as well is the different degrees someone can go through uh, to find more info about you. Because while you might have everything locked down, if your friends are posting photos about you, or, or you know, you have an association with that person, then someone could, you know, pivot from that person and try to find your other, other social medias just because that friend is pretty open with everything and they share stuff all the time. Uh, you could easily pivot from that person and search their friends list on a different social media, if that makes sense. So just have everything locked down if you don't need it to be uh, public for any reason. Uh, number four is third party IP tracking. Now this one's kind of interesting because it's a great way to find any weak, uh, I guess any blind spots that you might have. This this goes for your organization or your personal uh, IP address, but checking like Shodan, your IP address, like what's on the internet? Like what can an attacker see that's open on the internet right now? Because little did I know when I was running uTorrent, it actually opened up a port. Yes, I should have known that, but I just, I didn't know uTorrent was running and it opened up a port on my uh, firewall, which I'm like, so I, I uninstalled that i honestly had no idea it was running uh but that was great to know i i checked shodan i all you got to do is go on google type in what is my ip throw that into shodan and see what shows up or if you have a business uh do the same thing and you can actually get alerts from shodan anytime something changes so if the, a, a port is added uh you could get an email alert i believe uh from shodan if anything changes like that uh, and then number five i did mention this earlier in in the video but i'm not I, I want to make it clear. I am not saying VPNs are unnecessary. They are absolutely necessary where you need them. Um, if you're going to be doing work-related stuff, absolutely connect to the company's VPN. If you are browsing the internet at home and you're just going to Facebook or you're just going to Twitter or whatever, no, you do not need a VPN to do any of that. You're not hiding or masking anything by doing that. But if you are connecting to company resources, absolutely 1 million percent connect over a VPN, especially if you're in a public setting because those DNS requests are unencrypted and those, um, I guess if you're trying to access an internal resource while not on a VPN, that is clear text. And hypothetically, if someone is sitting in that coffee shop or whatever could intercept that, uh, they could, you know, they just gather more intel about the internal resources. But again, at the end of the day, where are the odds of that? Pretty low, but it's still good practice to have a VPN. I personally have my own personal VPN server. I made a video on how to do that yourself where you could connect anywhere in the world to your home uh, VPN server and connect internally from there. Oh, that's our, uh, that's the shoe rack. Um... Sorry, uh, absolutely use a VPN where necessary, but you definitely do not need to pay for a VPN provider. You could spin one up in DigitalOcean or something like that. But keep in mind, if you're using various VPN providers, their IP addresses are publicly available and some websites might actually block that. Um, same with Tor, uh, the uh, nodes are publicly available and those might get blocked themselves as well. So anyways, those are some tips I have I work in security. Um, I currently do threat intelligence, but you know these are just some tips that I recommend for just anyone in general to to go by. I mean, you can follow them if you want. They're just my suggestions. Uh, but anyways, if you enjoy content like this, please hit the subscribe button, the bell notification, hit the like button, and share this with all your friends because you know sometimes uh, people need a nice refresher on their cybersecurity uh, hygiene. Um, so yeah, leave a comment down below if you have any suggestions for future videos. And you all have a fine and dandy day. Thank you. Yes, I salute with my left hand. Get over it. <laughs>